as you see, oh, uh, some of the results uh, I'll show you today are based on the two papers. You see one fresh one and one uh, rather old. But I continue and you'll see we have some results. Uh, this just to remind you, and maybe some of uh, we have some new members and new young members of uh, IMO. So I'll uh, remind some point about modeling. Uh, Python is very interesting object. Uh, it has very, very small perihelion distance and very small orbit. Uh, nevertheless, it, it, it has, sorry, it has meteor shower. And uh, I made a model, a uh, model uh, test particles number 10 millions, only two masses of uh, particles, it is quite enough. And age is 2000 years, as was find, uh, found by my previous analysis. And integration was made by polynomial approximation. And how to model particle ejection? Uh, when we have parent body orbit, we choose, we choose an ejection point. Then we somehow calculate ejection velocity vector. Then we calculate the newborn meteoroid orbit and repeating this process 10 million times you have a model meteoroid stream a family of orbits uh, sorry i i should uh, change a view of my screen because oh yeah and this is a 3d model which we have. Uh, this circle is uh, the Earth. Uh, there is a place where we see shower. Now we have, now we, uh, what we have, this is a cross section. This is ecliptic plane. X, Y, it is ecliptic plane. And we see nodes of orbits, intersection of orbits with the ecliptic plane crosses by, uh, well, orange. This is larger meteoroids, this. And green, smaller meteoroids. And Earth crosses the streams, something like that, from right to the left. A cometary model which I used has three points, as essential points. The dust production increases towards perihelion. The ejection takes place mainly from the sunlit hemisphere of nucleus. And the third point and uh, the main for today's talk is that ejection speed depends on particles mass. The larger mass, the smaller speed. Uh, another point is that um, we, in fact, we don't know where the Earth intersects the stream. Uh, first, uh, first intersection I uh, noted A, it is uh, the Earth orbit. But we don't know. Maybe it intersects in B or C or D. So we should uh, analyze everything. This is radiant. Uh, sorry, uh, my my. Uh, oh yes. Uh, this is radiant for section A. Look how uh, how how it looks. Uh, Larger meteoroids cover a smaller area and uh, shift it a little bit to top. And smaller meteoroids uh, cover larger area, and it is not surprisingly 
because, as I said, ejection velocity was higher for them. Uh, but it is just model. In model, we see all clear and sound. In uh, observations, we have no exactly 10 minus 3 gram or 10 minus 4 gram uh, particles. Uh, it is like a continuum. Uh, so this picture will be very, very noisy. And it is not not clear could we uh, could we somehow distinguish one area from another area but let me change this plot to the right one solar longitude and alpha now you see it is a little bit more distinctive and even we have, uh, even, uh, for example, larger meteoroids could enter to uh, mix with smaller meteoroids beginning and end of the shower, beginning and end of activity of smaller and larger are different. Again, because of ejection velocity for larger meteoroids, is smaller. But as I told you, we don't know. Is it uh, Earth uh, intersects the stream here or at another place? But the model differs from real geminids in width and location. Uh, I think that Geminids were formed during catastrophic ejection with strong jet forces. And before this, Phaeton had another orbit. Uh, I repeat once more, my model is not intended for qualitative predictions, quantitative predictions, excuse me. It intended only for prediction of trends. And now you see uh, radiance for B, C, and D cross, uh, cross sections. And you see that uh, probably in observations, you can't find, you can't see this conf configuration. But if we go to this kind of plot, alpha uh, versus solar longitude, situation is a little bit better. Uh, uh, the previous was uh, analytical modeling. Uh, I confirmed these results by numerical modeling. It is a more a realistic force model. But in principle, it is the same, only a little bit more noisy as it should be, because semi-analytic model was not intended for, uh, did not include uh, a short, uh, period, pre, uh, short period, short period, short uh, period forces and uh, other things. Perturbations, yes. So how it is uh, radiant looking how it looks in a numerical model. The problem is calculation time. Integration of 60,000 orbits takes about 16 days on my uh, computer. Uh, and uh, results provided are statistically rather pure. For example, uh, we have only uh, this amount of particles in shower from 60 thousands of particles of the string. But uh, previous pictures was for all uh, period of observations. Uh, what happens when we observe only one night? Observe only one night. This is only for one night, so-called. We see uh, 
if it is one night, the beginning and end are the same for both kinds of particles, but they should be shifted. Why? Because of pointing Robertson effect. This was checked. What we can get from this? I await at least confirmation of the dependence ejection speed or mass for small epitome. Difference. For small emitter arrows, the speed is higher. Maximum we could find it is use, using of patterns to confirm other points, but for these, uh, we need very precise observations. But we have something already, uh, some hints in observations. On Meteoroids 2010, Maria Haidukova uh, noted that the, uh, the dispersion was found to be higher for smaller particles. And I uh, was trying to find something. Uh, well, no, I, not myself. But I uh, try to persuade observers to find something on observations. And this is suggested tactics to detect uh, this pattern in observations. Well, we should compare the most different mass ranges. And for these, uh, we should not mix observations, only samples proce processed by one, the same method, standard method, and maybe one camera's group, if statistics allows. And next you see a picture uh, which Anna Kartashova made for me uh, using uh, global meteor net observations of Geminids. And here you see uh, first and the last quartiles of uh, approximately 2000 orbits. What you see, uh, green is uh, larger on the large end of observations and red points on the smaller um, end of observations. Definitely. Definitely, we see that dispersion of red is higher. So we see at least second confirmation of this point. Uh, Maria Haidukova and co-authors in planetary space science found that uh, analyzing radians of Geminids for different uh, methods of observations found that uh, longer semi-major axis, longer semi-major axis, this one, occupies western part of the radiant and shorter, just opposite. Uh, what in my model? Uh, the same, but not quite the same. Uh, as you see, it is a shorter, a shorter semi-major axis here is uh, red and longer by violet. Uh, they, it is only for one mass. Look here, uh, they are, oh, sorry. Uh, not like this on horizontal, but like this a little bit. But in uh, principle here, uh, also we could find that it is not horizontal, but like this a little bit. Uh, now uh, let us see the last minute news. Yesterday in uh, Baravichka and Spurne talk, you could see this picture. Irzy was so kind to send it to me to input into presentation. And this is from my model. You see, uh, shortest semi-major axis, longest. And Irzy Barovichka, shortest, longest. And, uh, I like to see this. 
And this is uh, this is only. This is for uh, maybe uh, this uh, approximates better. It is for a cross section. It is for b cross section. So we came to another point. Uh, observations could help fit the model. So we should. Uh, I should. Uh, analyze space in the model between A and B probably to feed the observations, but I need more data as usual. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, good. And Galenia, we have an uh, online question from Alex Pratt, who is asking these M3 and M4 um, categories that you have, what would be their visual magnitude? So what brightness would these uh, meteorites have? Uh, I don't remember. Uh, I should check. Uh, but I could answer your questions in uh, chat, OK? This yeah. question. Uh, I, sh I should consult my previous publication. Uh, uh, yes, I estimated it. Okay, so then please check and uh, write it into the chat. Um, any other question? Yoshi. Uh, Darina, could you remind uh, us uh, 
what is the reason or how why do you think that the shower is 2000 years old uh, why uh, i can uh, i analyzed it into my uh, paper a rather old one but nothing new uh, appeared from since then uh, first one point that uh geminid uh, that geminid parent body asteroid phaeton 2000 years ago was uh at the orbit was at the closest point to the sun first second uh pointing robertson uh pointing robertson uh, shift of orbits could be used to calculate age. It, it was not very precise, but uh, more or less, it, it was a second point. Then uh, next, uh, particles, because of collision with uh, sporadical particles and because of uh, other things have, uh, they have, their own uh, time of life and for geminids it's only several uh, thousand years so uh, my uh, my estimation of age is uh, 2000 plus minus plus minus one say no. but uh, uh, but i used two because of as i said the orbit was closer, the perihelion distance was had minimum. And even, even at this minimum, I have no an ejection velocity high enough. Did I answer? Yes, thank you. Okay, we still have uh, time for one or two questions. Anyone here in the room? Or anyone online? Mm. All right, then I would say let's thank Galina again. And then we switch to the last talk um, of the morning, which is by Aisha R. Weiss and her collaborators about automation of meteor reduction using convolutional neural networks. Um, yes, uh, Aisha, we see your screen. And I hope you can hear as well. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. So the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I am Aisha Lewis presenting automation of meteor reduction using convolutional neural networks. Uh, to begin with, I am very happy to be here, happy to see names, familiar names whom we've been citing in our publications for the past few years. I'll take this opportunity to introduce you about the Sharjah Academy for Astronomy, Space Sciences and Technology. Then we'll move on to the introduction followed by methodology, results, conclusion and future work. So the Sharjah Academy for Astronomy, Space Sciences and Technology has uh, several different labs in addition to our planetarium. And in this paper, we are presenting the collaboration between the Meteorite Center as well as the Space Artificial Intelligence Lab. In this picture, you see the building of the academy, and here, this is an angle of the meteorite collection we have at the academy. Now, coming to uh, monitoring meteors, uh, monitoring them is part of the Space Situational Awareness Program, and we need to know what is happening in the UAE sky. Also, there is a lack of archived meteor data in the MENA region, excluding data coming from Morocco and Saudi Arabia, as far as we know. So that is why we established the UAE Meteor Monitoring Network with the UAE Space Agency 2000, in September 2018. And as we can see here in the map, the network consists of three towers. One is located in Sharjah. This is in the Academy's premise. This is in a heavily light polluted area. The second tower is in Al-Yahar. The third one is in Liwa. And each tower is five meters high. Each is equipped with 17 cameras. It's a mixture of six and eight mm lenses, as well as a fish eye uh, lens. Um, this, is, this is an example of one tower. This is the one in charge. The other two are identical to this tower. The other two are located in the deep desert. 
Now coming to the false alarm, alarm categories, we have 25% insects and airplanes, uh, about 71% uh, la la random light sources, as well as 4% camera noise, moonlight, and clouds. And the categories or the percentages of these types of noise, they differ from one station to another, depending on the light pollution in each area. So you can imagine the huge amount of data incoming from the Sharjah Tower, given that we are very close to the Sharjah International Airport. So we have a lot of airplanes captured by UFO capture, since that's the program that we use. Here's an example of what the false data looks like since UFO capture produces five different formats. We are presenting the masked version. This is, these are just masked noise. Here's the moon, those are airplanes. And here's another example of noise that look kind of similar to meteors as understood by the CNN. And basically this is what makes up our not meteors data set. So to prepare our data set, we utilized, this is a meteor, we utilized a mask, the masked version provided by UFO and uh, we converted them, whether it's a meteor or not meteor, to grayscale. This is easier for image classification, so it's either black or white. So it knows that if it's a white object, then this is the desired object that it will learn its edges and so on. This is what we do regarding pre-processing. To discuss the number of training images, we have data from the Sharjah Tower, which is with a lot of light pollution. The, the other one is from Al Yahar, which is in the desert. So for the training images of meteors, we have about 7,000 for meteors and not meteors as well. And for Al Yahar, we have about 4,500 for meteors and not meteors. And we also have some images close to 500 in Sharjah for validation meteors and not meteors, the same for Al Yahar uh, images. Coming to the testing images, we tested the models on 1,200 meteor images, 4,000 not meteor images, and you can see the numbers here for Lihar. Coming to the CNN models, first of all, the, this is the learning parameter, uh, learning rate that we used. The epochs for the four models that we have, they vary. Some of them were trained on 20 epochs, the others were on 30 epochs. This was a result of a lot of trial and error after developing at least 20 model for each uh, station. The optimizer we used was Adam and the input size was 720 by 576 pixels. And this is where we vary from different proposed uh, CNN projects in the Meteor uh, area. So as a means to downsample the image, we kept it as is, but we introduced average, max, average and max pooling layers at the beginning of, uh, of the architecture. And then it was followed by the conventional convolutional layer followed by max pooling. And here we had batch normalization instead of ReLU, the rectified linear unit uh, layer. The model uh, progressed until we reached the end where we introduced the ReLU layer followed by the dropout layer for overfitting purposes. Finally, fully connected layer and softmax layer to do the classification, either meteor or not meteor. The main difference between the Sharjah meteor and Sharjah not meteor is that here we use 20 epochs and here we used 30 epochs. Coming to the Yahar not meteor model, it is similar to Sharjah, but it is less in terms of the uh, needed uh, layers. And coming to the Yahar meteor model, the difference is that here we did not introduce uh, average pooling layers at the beginning. And surprisingly, it, uh, or maybe not surprisingly, it gave the best uh, meteor recall value, which we will see very soon. Coming to the automated reduction process. So we know that to have data of a full day, we need it from 12 a.m. to sunrise, and then the day comes in between. Then we, again, we need it from the sunset to 11.59 p.m. So we need to wait for a 24 hour cycle. So phase one occurs at 1 a.m. First of all, the folder is located. Then the program, a Python script, retrieves the date of the previous night. So it subtracts the day of today minus one to get the previous night. And then it extracts all of the masked version images, puts them in a temporary folder. Then uh, all of those masked images get converted to grayscale. And finally, it is uploaded to an online repository why? Because the stations at the, the computer stations uh, or the computers at the towers, they don't have the capability to run CNN models on them. That's why we have to upload them and download them in phase two. So phase number two, the, um, the, the folder is automatically downloaded. This 
this happens at 3 a.m. Then the images are fed to the CNN. Finally, as an output of the CNN, we receive a list which has the names of the files which are suspected meteors. This list is then uploaded again to the online repository. At 5 a.m. Uh, on the computer that is within the tower, each tower, a folder with the data appended uh, with the word reduced is created. So if we want reduced data of the previous day, we have the same date, but it's appended with the word reduced. It is also located exactly in the same place of the original file. Then the uh, list of suspected meteors is downloaded. And then the program cross-checks the text file content with the original folder. So if there is an image in the original folder and if it appears in the text file, then there is a match, meaning that this is a suspected meteor. What happens next is that all of those matching files or matching images, they get copied into uh, the reduced folder. So when we come to work at 7.30 a.m., we don't have to manually go through the original file. The original file can contain thousands of uh, files, but the reduced one contains much less. For example, yesterday's uh, file of Al-Yahar contained about 1,300 images, but the reduced version contained about 240 uh, files. Um, yes, there are false detections in the reduced folder, but at least no meteor has been missed so far. So this greatly uh, reduces the time to filter out uh, meteors. Now coming to the results, we will look at the recall score for the Sharjah model. We, the recall score uh, for meteors was 98, about 98%. For not meteors, it was 96. If we check the not meteor model, it had a better not meteor recall as 97.81%. So for Sharjah, because we have a lot of false alarms, we are